reminded me of that dream. I was really open to reading the book. Do you see? Um, and it turns out it was a different book by Martin Buber than the one that I had failed with. Uh, and this is a, was a book called Between Man and Me. And as I was reading that book, uh, I realized that Buber was talking to me about something that I was saying something in that book that I already knew. In a, in a really important kind of way, but that I had not yet had language for and that had not really quite come into focus for me. Because the big thing that Buber is, is saying in that book and in so much of what he, what he writes is to talk about the central importance, it relates a little to my epiphanies mm -hmm. workshop that I'm going to do, the central importance in our life of those moments when we find ourselves in a full-on kind of way engaged with another that we know is also turned to us with all of who they are. Those moments of really profound, deep connection that are not fusion moments. They're not moments where I forget me here, you there. But I'm really aware that I am connecting with you in your mysterious, unknown otherness, you know? It's your otherness, and yet we're completely engaged with each other. And it was Buber's sense that that's what life is really for, and that all the work that we might do in terms of individuation or integration or anything like that is for the sake of our being able to really be there in that kind of way with another, or with a series of others, you know, but really highlighting those moments as the life-giving moments, the meaning-giving moments. And when I read that book, I had such a sense of yes, uh, and that this is something that uh, Jung hadn't taught me, and that there was a part of me that it was already, before I read the book, in touch with the kind of recognition that this was just as important as that life-giving turn to the inner world. You? So, uh, you can imagine that uh, I was dismayed when I discovered that these two almost exactly contemporary men were quite aware of each other and each other's work and had very little regard for one another or one another's work. It seemed to me that these insights were completely complementary and kind of almost needed one another. It was kind of like almost breathing in and breathing out. And so it was dismaying to me uh, to discover that neither one of them appreciated that. And so that led me to a sense that uh, maybe it was my task to really make the, the world, in a way, know that these, these, these insights balance one another. They're both just so much a part of what it is to have a rich, full life, you know? Uh, but I also realized that at this point, I'm a 28-year-old New Jersey housewife with five preschool kids. Um, and that probably no one in the world is going to pay very much attention to anything I have to say. Right? And I also was aware that I really didn't have the competence in the, the whole tr tradition of uh, psychology or philosophy uh, or religion to write about this understanding of mine in a way that uh, would be really persuasive. And that's what sent me to graduate school. So I get to graduate school. 
And one of the things that I learned when I get to graduate school, which I trust you are all learning, is that being in graduate school involves engagement with primary texts. You're not reading textbooks anymore, you're reading the stuff itself. You're not reading some, like for in this course, you're not reading books about what Jung or Freud have to say. You're reading Jung and Freud, right? And um, so when I got to graduate school, I, I get, began to really appreciate the importance of hearing from people themselves what it is they have to say. And I realized at that point that the only Freud I knew was Jung's version of Freud. And that uh, it was kind of time for me to read Freud on my own. And so uh, there was actually no course on Freud in the particular graduate program that I was in, which was a program uh, on a religion and culture. And it was really a very interdisciplinary program, in some ways, very much like the mythological studies program here at Pacifica. Uh, where we were looking, really not primarily at religious texts, but we were looking at, in the, in the program, in that doctoral program, we were looking really at all the ways in which we humans uh, have used images to help us try to understand what it is to be us and, and to understand how we're related to our fellow humans and to the natural world. So a lot of philosophy, a lot of literature, a lot of anthropology, psychology and religion, you know. Uh, but there was no course on Freud. <laughs> and uh, so, but so the second semester I was there, I persuaded uh, the faculty person that I, to whom I felt most wrong, and who I knew had some real expertise in Freud, I persuaded him to do an independent study with me on Freud. And uh, it turned out that he was a very demanding taskmaster. Because during the course of that semester, where I was also doing the two courses or whatever that were you know, part of the curriculum, uh, I did this independent study with him. And, we, and he assigned me just about all of Freud to write, to read. And that's uh, 22 volumes, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot. And some secondary sources. Uh, and so you ask, you get huh? what? <laughs> yeah, what you ask, yeah, you ask what you get. But the other thing that was so astonishing to me was that uh, this professor laid the same task on himself. Mm -hmm. This is big. I, you know, I think of myself as a dedicated teacher, but I've never done anything like this. Never. Mm -hmm. uh, so week by week, he too was reading two, three hundred pages of Freud. And then we would meet one evening a week uh, in his apartment, which was just across the street from the school. And we'd talk. And he'd lend me his books. I was, a, you know, uh, I didn't have a whole lot of money for books and stuff like that. And, uh, and I encountered Freud. <coughs> and when I started in on this, I had no expectation at all that the Freud that I would discover in reading Freud would be in any significant way different from Jung's version of Freud. Uh, this was mostly just you read them yourself kind of feel. But what, I, what happened was that I discovered that Freud, as he presented himself and his story and his theory and so on, was very different actually. Uh, from the way that you present. And, uh, and I discovered that this encounter was for me just as important as that earlier encounter with you had been. And that in many ways, I experienced my relationship to Freud as having a very different kind of feel to it than my relationship with Jung. Remember, I said at the beginning of this that I had the experience that Jung in some way mothered my soul. Uh, for me, the engagement with Freud was more like the engagement with a father, and more like my engagement with my father. Because I know women particularly have all 
different ways of having, you know, been, been engaged with their dads. But my particular father was someone who really blessed my intellectual ca capability uh, and uh, my real engagement with thinking and my creativity and kind of my, my courage or whatever, my energy in general, I guess. And I can remember how I, he would, he, during the years that I was in high school, he drove me to school every morning and just the two of us were in the car. And we would spend that whole time arguing. But in a way that we both fully, fully enjoy, you know, uh, and just arguing about everything in the world. We were kind of reading the same books. We'd go to the library together on Fridays and come each grab a whole, Hand, you know, a whole stack of books and then we'd pass them back and forth. So we'd be arguing about the books and we'd be arguing about politics and just about anything, you know. But we, we enjoyed it, you get that? And it was kind of appreciating one another. Uh, and that's my relationship to Freud. So it's not a relationship that says yes, yes, yes to everything Freud has to say. But it's a sense that he's there and he's there kind of encouraging me to think both with and against him, but to be, if through my exposure to him and the particular topics he introduces and the particular thing he has to say about those topics, to help encourage me to discover what my own understanding of those themes is. Do you get that? And that's, that's different from what I got from Jung, which was just a kind of blessing, but not the same challenge. I don't know if I can present this exactly clearly, but it was something that was really very important, you know, this kind of engagement. Uh, and uh, so, you know, so that's really how I came to Freud. And then I guess the other thing I want to say at this point is that I have kind of ever since then, continue to have a sense that there's a way in which Jung is the mother of my soul and Freud is the father of my soul. And that when, when I encounter situations where it seems to be people are suggesting you've got to choose one or the other, uh, that it feels to me that like that's what happens to a child of divorced parents. You know? And that's not something I could do. You know, so uh, they're still there. Uh, both of them as my teachers, and Boober too, my three most important teachers. Uh, so, uh, 